Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to Project Ships to Shores and our interview with Bruce Kemp. Project Ships to Shores is a cross-country initiative created by the Broad Reach Foundation with support from the Government of Canada and in partnership with many other community organizations. The project aims to engage at least 2,000 youth between the ages of 7 and 30 across Canada in activities focused on the marine sector through four streams, arts and culture, economic activities, civic engagement, and history and heritage. Youth will participate in digital activities where they will share knowledge and culture, build skills in entrepreneurship and leadership, and create an increased sense of belonging. So now I'm excited to pass it over to Randall, who will be conducting the interview with Bruce. Hello, everyone. My name is Randall. I am a volunteer with Ships to Shores. And today we're taking a, about 30 minutes to give you a little taste of the maritime history of the Great Lakes. Uh, we're going to touch on why it was important to Canada in its development, give you some sense of the ships that sailed those waters uh, and the men and women that crewed them, uh, touch on how did they navigate the Great Lakes? Because we're, we're talking a uh, hundred years ago and everybody knows about GPS, but they knew nothing about G GPS then. And we're gonna end up with some adventure stories about some pretty dramatic rescues. How are we gonna do this? Uh, we're gonna do it with the knowledge and enthusiasm of Bruce Kemp. Bruce is an author, a journalist of esteem. He is an award-winning photographer. And if you saw the list of his awards, it would take us another 30 minutes to go through them all. He is also a sailor, a scuba diver. You might say that uh, Bruce has water in his veins, not blood. And we're going to ask Bruce to stop with uh, uh stop no start with just an overview of why uh the lakes are important to us bruce in in our maritime history well you've got to remember that um the the development of uh the uh the country as we know it today uh so post arrival of the settlers uh was really dependent on uh, water transportation, uh, we've all driven up north uh, through the Canadian Shield, and you know it's rock after rock after rock, punctuated by trees and water. Um, so, if you wanted to ship something from here to from uh, Kingston to Thunder Bay or to uh, Sault Ste. Marie, the the sanest thing to do is put it on a ship, take it over the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes. Uh, were according to the French uh, French uh, explorers, uh, the great freshwater seas. They were so vast that people thought that they led to China initially. Right. Uh, that was erroneous. But in the you know in the outcome of that, what happened was that people started to uh, recognize that this was a transportation route par excellence. Uh, if you ever get the chance to uh, uh, sail from uh, Thunder Bay to Newfoundland on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence, you're going to recognize that this is probably one of the top three um, uh, rivers in the world, river systems in the world. So uh, in, in the days pre-401, the Great Lakes became the 401. All every good that was shipped uh, was shipped uh, by vessel, uh, and uh, that included package freight. So if you ordered something for Mister Eaton, it uh, you know it just kind of came on a ship. Uh, bulk freight, uh, which is ore and grain uh, and and aggregate and salt. Uh, those all came on ships. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, if you wanted uh, fuel oil, uh, that all came on ships. Okay, now there were different types of ships, but they, they you know, they were all vessels supplying the Great Lakes. Well, when I was um, reading your book, um, Weather Bomb 1913, and we're not going to explain that title just yet, we're going to leave you in suspense. <laughs> 
But it struck me that there were so many ships sailing. They were, you mentioned the 401. It's like the ships of those days at the turn of the century were like the trucks of absolutely. today. They were that important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, they were the delivery trucks. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until uh, the 1960s, uh, the late 1950s and 1960s, that we re really developed um, an interprovincial interstate highway system. I mean, it was Dwight Eisenhower who developed the highway system, the interstate highway system in the United States. And it was uh, John Diefenbaker who put the uh, fire under the Canadian developers and started to plan uh, a, uh, an interprovincial road system. So up until that point, and that's, that's within living memory. Yeah. Everything traveled by, you know, everything of consequence traveled by water. One, one last question about the lakes. I know that Thunder Bay, also known as Lakehead, is kind of the western point. How far east could you start sailing all the way to Lakehead? Would it be Kingston? Um, no, uh, you know, that Montreal? opens right that opens right in from the, uh, from the ocean. I mean, uh, I've been in Thunder Bay with uh, ships from China and from uh, Spain, and um, it is a truly international waterway. So. Okay. Um, so the, the next part we just like to, uh, to talk about is, um, and we're talking a hundred years ago now. I mean, these, these were pretty big ships, were they not? Um, Bruce, 150 feet, 200 feet? Uh, yeah, uh, they were sized to fit in the canals, and that was approximately 250 feet. Okay, okay cool. So they, they were substantial vessels. Um, the, uh, the largest of the vessels that was lost in the storm was the... Um, oh, God, there goes my brain. <laughs> was it the um, Wexford? The James Brothers. And uh, she was over 400 feet. Wow. Wow. And yeah, she was in, a big... in, in terms of the crew for a ship like that, are we talking a dozen? How, how, oh, how many oh, men? Yeah, the brothers, I believe, was upwards of 30. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe 31, 32. Okay. And um, given the size of the vessels, given the fact that the lakes can be um, treacherous, and we're talking 19... 10, 19, 13, what sort of technology would be on board the ships to help them navigate the weather and the dangers? Well, basically it was pretty primitive. First off, you had a compass. Uh, and, uh, you know, that points you in a general direction. Uh, but you also had an aneroid barometer, which foretold highs and lows moving through. Uh, in the 1913 storm, uh, you know, there's a saying that the barometer fell off the wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, in a sense, is pretty, pretty accurate. Then um, a lot of the ships had um, a depth sounding machine, essentially a lead line on a, on a winch. Yes. And uh, they could lower it down and, and find the bottom. Now, navigation on the lakes was not like that on the ocean. Uh, first off, you, you have to consider that you don't have much of what is called sea room. Okay. You can turn left or right. And in most lakes, within 50 miles, you're going to hit the shore. Okay. Okay. On the ocean, uh, I got caught in Hurricane Bob in 19, I think it was 91. Uh, out on Long Island Sound, we just passed Montauk, uh, and Bob did a Bob did a double down on us. It came ashore at Cape Hatteras, came up the spine of the Appalachians, and then came instead of dying there, which hur hurricanes often do, it came back out Long Island Sound and caught us. Uh, and it was right on our stern. We saw it coming. We paid off. Uh, and we ran ahead of the wind for uh, with uh, basically a, a tiny storm trysail for three days, got halfway to Bermuda uh, oh before Lord. we could turn around and come home. Wow. Uh, so you have a lot of sea room to do something like that. On the lakes, you don't. 
you have, and, and the lakes, uh, particularly on the northern side, are full of rocks. You know, we have the 30,000 islands at, near, near Perry Sound. Those are all rock islands. You know, right. we get uh, the islands in the North Channel. Those are all rock islands. The shores of the Bruce Peninsula are, you know, uh, Precambrian rock, uh, the shores of Manitoulin. So you've got this danger, you, you, you're in this situation of being perpetually on a lee shore, wherever you are in the lakes. So uh, one of the things that I note in uh, 1913, I was uh, sailing with my friend, Sha Captain Sean O'Donoghue, and it struck me that these guys are very similar to London cab drivers. We've all heard the story how London cab drivers have the knowledge. You can tell them you want to go to two Ipswich Lane, and they know exactly where it is. They don't have to look it up. And Great Lakes captains are just like that. They know the shores, the rivers, the lakes uh, intimately. I mean, they, they, you know, Sean could look at a... Uh, uh, a part of the St. Mary's River, and he told me where we were just from looking at the way the current set. Well, uh, that br that brings me to a quote which completely surprised me by one of the captains. And the captain said, I do the mathematics, I correct the angles, and I watch the clock. But this is useless unless I can get a clear patch to see some landmarks on shore to confirm my guessing. That astonished me. So it, when the ships were sailing up, were they always inside of land? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, you know, there are places uh, uh, on the Great Lakes where you're absolutely out of sight of land. But that quote is in reference to being stuck in the storm. Uh, they were in whiteout conditions. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, the landmarks on shore are really verification points rather okay. than, uh, you know, necessary all the time. I mean, on a beautiful sunny day, uh, these guys would take their pocket watch, point, it, point the, hour hand, the hour hand toward the sun and halfway between the sun and the uh, minute hand would be south. So Amazing. they knew which way they were going. Amazing. And can you talk a little bit when we're talking technology, um, there are references to these symbols that were at, I guess, the harbor mouths that gave some indication to the captains either leaving or coming. Well, what okay, sort those of the are the weather reporting stations. Yeah. And uh, they, they had two systems, one for the day and one for the night. And there was a series of code flags. And uh, they were connected by telegraph to the Dominion Meteorological Observatory and to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so what would happen was be, uh, you know, a, a report would, a MET report would be generated. It would be sent out to all, all of these stations uh, and the, for the region. And then they would put up the appropriate flags or lanterns. Okay, they used lanterns at night, of course, uh, colored lanterns. So you had red and white, uh, and uh, the flags uh, were red and white, red and black, and uh, the day, way they were sewn together. A uh, 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 heavy gale, uh, because we didn't really consider uh, the Great Lakes to suffer from hurricanes. Heavy gale had a black border, a red interior followed by a black center. And if you had two of those up, that meant get into a damn harbor or get behind an island and batten down. So, um, and would, would those, were, were those signals only at the harbor or were they placed at different distances well, they're along the shore? Different points. There was one at the mouth of the St. Clair River where yep. at the confluence of the St. Clair and Lake Huron, there was one at Detour Passage. There was one at, uh, I'm not sure if it was in Colchester or Hammersburg down on Lake Erie. Uh, there, there were, you know, several dozen of these around. Okay. And, and, and so they reported the weather and gave the uh, captains a little advance warning. 
One, one of the other um, many surprises in the book, but, but one that I had not thought of, is that there are references to life-saving boats that are based on land and would be sent out to ships in distress. They seem to be all based in the States. Is that true or were there Canadian? Oh, no, they were Canadian. Uh, they, these, were, these were patterned both in the United States and in Canada after the Royal Life uh, uh, Saving Boats in yeah. Britain. Uh, you know, it was the same concept. And, uh, but the thing was, was that uh, the, um, in, in Canada during the storm, there just, you know, there were, there were no ships to rescue. Uh, uh, but uh, in the United States, in particular, I think you're referring to the, the rescues that uh, took place at the uh, Kuwaitan Peninsula. Uh, those guys were right there and the ships grounded on the peninsula. So they, they had come ashore, really. You know, Gull Island Rock is like 500 meters offshore. So in, in terms of um, ships running into to trouble, would, would, the, would it be because they're kind of blown onto the shore or would they, would there be collisions or would they just, would, or would they sink in open water? Well, some of them sank in open water. Uh, there, there is one uh, that uh, a lot of people have speculated there was a collision uh, that took place between the Regina and the Charles F. Price. I don't think that happened personally. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, uh, there, there is a very good re uh, uh, record of uh, waves overcoming uh, ship called the Lions. And uh, these guys, the, you know, these, a lot of these sank out in mid lake, uh, particularly on Lake Huron in open water. Okay. Um, so, you know, it was just uh, uh, a factor of the seas. They were horrible, horrible seas. And just one last question about uh, the life saving boats. Would they be all enclosed, unlike, say, a regular lifeboat? Would no, they be kind they, of roofed in? They, they were wide open. They might have had a cuddy cabin to put people that they rescued in. Uh, but basically, uh, for the uh, crew, they were wide open. They sat on benches at oars. And uh, it, it, uh, one of the boats from Eagle Harbor tried to go out and came back in, and they were so isolated they had to chip the guys out of the seats so they could get out of the out of the boat. I, I remember that image and I couldn't believe it that uh, that these guys were literally frozen into the boat because of the cold. Amazing. Tough men, tough, tough men. Um, so can you just give us uh, a brief picture of how strong the storm was back in 19? 13, some images of how it affected the ships, what the crews had to deal with, because reading it, it I mean, it's kind of like sci-fi to me. Well, it is almost like sci-fi. Uh, you've got to remember that uh, meteorolo meteorologists call this a once in 500 year or a once in 1,000 year storm. Uh, everything came together to create this weather monster. Right. Um, and... Uh, I, I thought about calling the book Weather Monster, actually, but uh, the, the, there is a technical term called the weather bomb. And that's when uh, the uh, barometer drops so substantially in 24 hours that it's like a, an explosion going off. Now, in terms of the seas, um, you have to understand that, particularly in Lake Huron, where these ships went down, the seas were following seas uh, for the most part. A lot of the ships that went down had left detour passage at the north end of Lake Huron and were southbound. Okay. Like the Brothers, uh, the Lions, uh, uh, the Sheetle, um, uh, any, uh, the Sheetle, not the Lions. Uh, the Lions was the captain of the Sheetle. Uh, and uh, they were southbound. And what happened was is that first off, there's a, cur a south setting current on that edge of the lake. <clears throat> they were at the very 
western edge of the storm, uh, the wind was coming down from the north and northwest, uh, piling up seas. Uh, these are not like the ocean swells that develop far away and, and they're really a kinetic wave that travels through the ocean. These are surface waves that are generated by the, by the wind and, uh, and also compounded by the fact that as you get closer to the south end of Lake Huron, it gets shallower. And uh -huh. so all this energy that's built up, it has nowhere to go. It can't go through the bottom. It has to raise the top. So okay. it essentially raises the roof into these. Uh, I've seen a reference, but it's never been proven. One old, one old sailor said the waves were 50 feet high. Oh, my Lord. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how you cut it, whether you're on the ocean or on uh, sweet water, that's a big wave. Indeed. And, and it's believable, I think, because the waves curled over and smashed in the skylight on the engine room on the sheetle. Okay. So it had to be that much higher. Higher. Than this right. Wood roof. Um, and and I, I think there was, uh, again, this astonished me. I think it was the LC Waldo had the whole forecastle sheared off the vessel. So that shows the, the strength of this. Yeah, it wasn't storm. actually sheared off the vessel, but uh, the stern was, uh, you know, made so uninhabitable that the uh, crew had to take refuge in the, uh, in the forecastle. Okay. And uh, the uh, a guy I really love this Arthur Lemke uh, is one of those practical geniuses that are out there. He took the bathtub out of one of the uh, uh, staterooms, turned it over, punched the bottoms out of a bunch of buckets, and made a furnace in the forecastle to keep to keep people warm. Amazing. Yeah, and just a brilliant guy. Would they be using coal from the ship, or would they breaking be breaking up kind of wooden interior? I think I think they were burning the furniture. Oh my God! Okay. okay. Uh, but you've got to remember. I mean, those ships, the interiors were all done in uh, oak paneling. There was a lot of oak available around the Great Lakes, white oak. So you know they would use the most uh, common woods, and they would build the accommodations with that. So it was a matter of taking your ship apart from the inside out, trying to keep warm. Wow. There was one other rescue, which again um, struck me. And it was one of the ships, I think it was Northern Queen. It was grounded about a thousand yards offshore. Yeah. And they're given the, you know, the, the waves and the cold, there was no way the crew could simply sort of jump overboard. But they did get a line to shore. So once they got the line to shore, how would how would the crew manage to escape through that? that well, they, they would they would uh, go into the they would go into the uh, the lifeboat. The lifeboat would be attached to the line. Okay. And so they would pull themselves into the shore, and uh, there'd be a, a, a trip line on the uh, uh, lifeboat. So the remaining guys on the ship would pull the uh, pull the boat back out and make the trip in again. Fantastic. So it was like a kind of pulley system then, like a conveyor yeah. belt. Yeah. Amazing. Um, you're a scuba diver, and you mention in the book that you did some diving around the wrecks. Can you just give us a few images from whatever that adventure was? I think the one that sticks with me most is my first dive on the SS Regina. And that's off the Michigan shore. And um, I, got, I got interested in it in the storm of 1913, first off, because I'm from Sarnia. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of lived in your conscience, you know, your, that there was a bad storm and and, you know, you heard people talk about it while I was growing up, but I never did know much about it. Uh, the first dive I made on one of the wrecks from the storm was on the Charles S. Price. And that, that was really interesting. But 
the, the dive on the Regina was very eerie because I came down a hand line that was attached to the propeller shaft. Yes. And I came down through a lot of murk and it's about 80 feet of water. And as I got closer and closer, I saw the word Regina appear on the stern. It had been uh, cut and hammered, wel hammered welded to the uh, stern and the white paint was still on there. So it was like a ghost saying hello. Yes. Um, uh, I do know a diver who uh, on that dive found and recovered a, uh, a bottle, a whiskey bottle that was full of matches. And uh, subsequently, it's been given to the Godridge Museum. And uh, they were obviously getting ready to leave the boat. And that's what prompted me to, you know, uh, when I wrote that fictional introduction. Yes to try to get the guys off the ship uh, after they got the anchors out. And, and for everybody listening, I, I, would, I would really encourage you um, to pick up a copy of- So would I, I'm broke. <laughs> Weather Bomb and 1913. And what Bruce mentions, he does a wonderful job at the very beginning of the book of recreating the sense of what was going on, I believe it was the, was it the SS Regina and, and Captain McConkey? Yes. And when you read that, you will see how devastating the storm was, how limited the resources the crew had in terms of riding it out. And the one I found, again, surprising and rather poignant, there is a point where uh, Captain McConkey uses his ship to try and protect another ship from, from the storm. And I just thought that was, spoke to the spirit of, of the Brotherhood of Sailors. Well, that, that, you know, that was basic seamanship. And yes, you know, you don't have, it would take a cruel man to try to abandon somebody and not try to rescue. Yeah, well, it was, I, I didn't expect it, but it was, uh, it was very poignant to see that he was not looking after his own safety and the safety of his crew. He was also trying to help another ship in distress. Yeah. So we're nearly at time. So the important thing is, this is the book. <laughs> and it is, it is available um, in a number of stores. Uh, if you're in the Toronto area, there is a wonderful bookstore called The Nautical Mind. It's right down on Harbor Front. I have used their services in the past. They're fast, they're friendly. And if you have a, I was gonna say a pencil, but maybe if you have a tablet or something, their number is 416-203-1163. I'll just say that again, 416-203-1163. That's in the kind of GTA area. If you're back at uh, Bruce's hometown in around Sarnia, there's another bookstore uh, called the Sarnia Bookkeeper, and their phone number is 519-337-3171. I'll give you one more chance to do all the typing. 519-337-3171. And if you're a little ways up uh, Lake Huron uh, in Godrich. You can get Bruce's book at Fincher's Gifts and Books, and their number is 519-524-6901. Try it one more time, 519-524-6901. It is a book that will introduce you to, you might say, the magic, the mystery, uh, the drama and the courage that all these things are tied up uh, in the Great Lakes, specifically the great storm of 1913 in Lake Huron. And uh, the other thing we should mention is that Bruce is a writer knowledgeable about the lakes, as we can see. And he has another book just coming out called Whales, Whales of Lake, lake Erie. Erie. And I have to say, 
it shows my lack of knowledge. I did not know that there were whales in Lake Erie. Well, there, there really are. It has to do with a funny story. Uh, where, uh, you know, where weather bomb was full of death and destruction, you know, I, I uh, made a passage with a ship called the Canadian Leader. And uh, I like to refer to the captain and the uh, chief engineer as Calvin and Hobbes. And <laughs> uh, the uh, wheelhouse became our tree fort. And uh, a lot of what I wrote were just simply recording their stories and the, the funny stories that, that they tell about sailing. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you have to read the book to find out the story, find out about the story of the whales. That's great. And uh, <coughs> just to remind everyone who's listening, uh, we will be talking with Bruce again about the whales that are not quite whales of Lake Erie. So keep um, checking with shipstoshores.ca, our website, there is an activities page. And you'll be able to find out uh, as soon as we get the inf information up uh, where you can discover sailing along Lake Huron with Bruce Kemp. Yeah. Thank you for I'm, being with us today. Bruce, well, any last just, words? Yeah, just before we go, um, you can also check my website, uh, brucekempphotography.net. And that's Kemp Photography with two Ps. Don't go short of P. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening, okay. and we'll see you again with Bruce Kemp. Thank you, Randall.